Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he was transfigured before them. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with them. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the Bible, there are times where God gives a caveat to what he is saying. He reveals a glorious truth, yet because we humans often jump to the wrong conclusions, he clarifies what the news doesn't mean so that we don't get the wrong impressions. Both things are true, the glory and the reality, and he teaches us this, lest when we face reality, we deny the glory. I'll give you three examples this morning of Jesus revealing glorious truths, yet explaining what these things mean and what they do not mean. First, Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 10 that he was their master, yet that did not mean that the world would love them. He had just sent them out with his power and authority to heal the sick, cleanse the leper, even raise the dead and cast out demons. But that didn't mean the world would roll out the red carpet for them. Though they came with God's power to save and heal, the world would surprisingly treat them as if they were the devil, even though they came to raise people from death and save them from hell. Another example of this principle of Jesus giving a qualification to the wonderful promises he gave is in Mark chapter 10. There Jesus lauded and praised and commended his disciples for leaving everything behind in order to follow him. And Jesus promised there in that moment, though they had left all things behind, he promised them a family of believers now for the ones they lost in return, mothers and daughters and fathers and brothers and sisters. Right now, he said, even in the Christian church and in the age to come, eternal life. But Jesus slips one thing into the mix that they would receive now, lest they think this life would be easy. All this will come, he said, with persecutions. Easy always here in this life? No. But good to be with Christ as his disciples with many blessings, to lean on our fellow disciples here in the body of Christ when we're heavy laden with the suffering of this world. Yes, that is very good. The third example of God revealing great truths to us, but then giving some clarifying comments, was in Luke 2 as Mary and Joseph went to the temple. An aged man and prophet named Simeon all of a sudden picks up their child in his arms when he sees them come into the temple, declaring him to be the Savior of the world, the light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of God's people Israel. But lest Mary and Joseph think that having this child would mean some sort of easy picnic or that Christ's life would be easy, he turned to Mary and said, Lo, this child will be a sign that many will speak against, and a sword will pierce your own soul also. As Jesus was on the cross, the statement of Simeon would be fulfilled. Jesus was the light of, and salvation of the world, and yet at the same time he was a sign of salvation that the world did not receive. As the world drove a spear into the side of Christ, surely a pain pierced Mary's heart and side as well, as she looked on and grieved a world that rejected and killed her own son. So we see this to be the case. When glorious things are shown and truths are revealed about God, we can jump to human conclusions. We can have all sort of fanciful ideas about what it means. Because I'm a Christian, I will not struggle with sin or doubt or great unbelief anymore. Because I'm God's child and he is on my side, I will be victorious all the way. It will be rainbows and resurrections, and life will not be about suffering. God has his not-so-fast moments to show that on this side of glory, the glory is hidden in faith. Things are true as we have seen, but it is not always what we expect it to be. Faith believes and clings to the many things we do have, in and amidst the things that are not yet on this side of glory that we wish would be. We cling to the glorious truths that God has revealed, even in the face of those sometimes things being hidden in suffering in, in the cross. But just as sometimes we need a dose of reality when we come to glorious moments, 
Sometimes we need a dose of glory when we come to difficult moments. In the midst of the wounds and pain and suffering and sin of this life, God sometimes shows us a bit of His glory. He takes the curtain of separating heaven and earth away for a moment for us to see what is behind it, lest we forget, lose heart, despair, give up, or lose our faith. The Bible says a bruised reed he will not break, nor a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. God did this for Stephen when he was about to be stoned. Suddenly the heavens were opened. I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. That was God's pat on the back. Great sermon, Stephen. These stones you are about to face aren't going to be easy, but you have my commendation. Stephen died, and they said his face looked like that of an angel. So transfixed was he by the glory of God. God's glory is sometimes a pick-me-up amidst the pain. Another example of God showing his glory amidst suffering and pain was when the women went to the tomb of Jesus. The juxtaposition of death and the powerful testimony of heavenly beings was enough to send them running and wondering if their conclusions about death were reality. We know, too, that the events of Jesus' birth were so ordinary and normal that we would all have missed the import of them if God did not send a delegation of angels to stinky shepherds singing to them with songs from the sky. And Joseph, too, was having a hard time believing that his engaged wife-to-be named Mary became pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. So he was sent a vision of angels in the night as he became convinced at what he should do. And God sent this to the Joseph of the Old Testament, too, when he was in the dungeon and when he was sold as a slave by his brothers. He had his dreams that God had given God confirming and showing in the midst of the suffering of what he was facing, the glowing and burning visions of what was true beyond any shadow of a doubt, but looked contrary to present experience. It is not so easy to believe in a dungeon that you're going to be prince of Egypt, let alone get out alive. It is not so easy to believe that your Lord, who had just been brutally killed on a cross and beaten, was risen from the dead. God gives us these glorious and shining moments through the Spirit and the Word. He comes to us and He reveals His truth so deep and high and wide that we see them again to be the case. He does this so we can go into the storm, into suffering, into death, and shout in the face of hell, God is my refuge and strength. It is true behind, beyond any shadow of a doubt. So here is what we've covered thus far this morning. Sometimes amidst the glory of what we have in this life as Christians, God shows us the cross ahead so we don't lose the faith where and when those big crosses happen. And sometimes before the cross ahead, he shows us the glory, the amazing glory and vision of what is true. So which then is this morning? Which one is it? Well, if we see something so glorious and bright, we must know what lies ahead. A big cross, the largest ever. We must hold this vision tight. When you and I go on to the sorrows of Lent, when you and I face the sufferings of this world these next months and weeks and days in our own life, our own failures, the persecution of the world, when it's hard to sing and praise and even harder to pray, it is this event today that we look back upon. Like Moses, we hold the vision bright and we leave the event with our faces still shining. The glory goes with us, what we have learned on the mountain, the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Like the disciples, we too see Jesus, and we see him only. But really then, what is the point of the transfiguration and this vision? What does it teach us? It's a very simple point, that Jesus goes with us into the valley, and that he does not come to stay on mountain heights. You see, what happened at the Mount of Transfiguration mirrors God's meeting with his people on Mount Sinai. God met with his people there in the Old Testament so that he could reveal his will to them, that he could go down, that his glory could descend from the mountain to be with them. He would join them in the tabernacle and tent of goatskins where he would lead them through the wilderness, defeat their enemies so that they could enter the land of promise. 
And along the way, he would be their God. He would forgive their sins through the sacrifice they received in that tent, as well as feed them with the finest of wheat flour, bread from the sky, and water from the rock that followed them and gushed out continuously with water. Moses went up to the mountain then to receive the law of God from the mouth of God to deliver it to the people. And his face shone with glory in the good news of God, who was about to leave the mountain behind to go with them. And we see again today Moses meeting on the mountain with God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He speaks with Jesus as a friend speaks to an old friend. Nice to see you again, Moses. Well, hello, Jesus. Nice to see you too. It's been a while since we've been on the mountain together. This time, the disciples, the chosen ones, are there with Jesus as he's transfigured before them, and his face shines with the light of light as God of God. Their faces gleam in that moment with the reflected glory of God as the cloud of God brightly overshadows them. Christ aims not to stay in the mountain. The goal is not to pitch a tent here. He has already pitched a tent in the person of his human nature. He wears not goat skins, but our skins and clothing even as he comes down into the valley to lead his people to the mountain ahead. He aims to bring reconciliation with the Father through the sacrifice he will make in his own flesh. And by his death and life, we have the forgiveness of sins. Through his sacrifice, we are cleansed, readied, and made whole so that God can go with us for our blessing, that he can lead us ever onward to our home in heaven, that promised land. He feeds us on our journey with the finest of wheat flowers, his body and his blood. He gives us baptismal waters from the rock, which wash us and cleanse us of all sins. We are on a journey, and with Christ, he is with us. He has become one with us in our human nature, and he shines with the glory of God, but is present with us in his humanity. Jesus is with you. Believe it in the coming days ahead. God shone on Mount Sinai. He revealed himself to them. The one who flashed his lightning and struck the cows in Egypt. The one who destroyed the strength of Egypt and turned their rivers to blood. The one who turned the lights off in the sky in Pharaoh's living room as if they were on a switch. That God who led his people through the Red Sea and had them walk through the seabed on dry ground, who opened rivers and rained down bread. He was there. He who taught his own and led them out without any power or worthiness in them. He who patiently led them and fed them and forgave their sins was there and now is here. This theophany, this vision of God is to show that this is the God who shines in glory, the God who is with us and goes with us on our journeys. We are called to believe these things, and we are called to hold them tight in the days ahead. We are called to believe that Christ in his word and humble instruments is enough, that the gifts he gives and the bread are enough to preserve our holiness, that God has given enough in the body, life, and world to get you through. You put your hopes here. You lose your faith when things get tough. You miss the glory in the midst of the pain. God rebukes your unbelief, and he brings you back. Believe these things hear me. God gives his glory in the suffering, and we can look in the face of Jesus, the face of the anointed, and be radiant by the glory that we see. And Peter, who was on the mountain with Jesus, speaks to us in his epistle today. He said, we have something more sure. Interesting. More sure, better than what they had in the Mount of Transfiguration. Well, what would that be? We have something more sure we have the prophetic word in which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Holy words revealed to you. Yes, you have a personal theophany greater than Mount Sinai, greater than the Mount of Transfiguration. According to the premier apostle, Saint Peter, 
You have a shining light in a very dark place. You have a place that every time you uncover it, open it, it shines with the glory of God on each page into your own face. You have the revelation of God's glory when words are spoken here in church and the voice of God's word is read to you or taught to you by your pastor or by your teachers alike. You have this personal mountaintop amidst the times where you cannot see. You have the word of God. That word of God shines in dark places, in dark corners, and in a dark world until the morning star rises in your hearts. God gives his glory, and he gives it mightily, so that in the days ahead, your face might shine by his face, which shines upon you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.